I'd now like to introduce the Executive Director of the Housing Solutions Lab and today's moderator, Dr. Martha Galvez. Martha's dedication, insight, wit, and top-notch research skills will be put to excellent use on this important initiative. We are so grateful to have you, Martha, guiding the ship. Please join me in welcoming Martha with a virtual round of applause, or you can feel free to applaud at your, at your computer. Martha? Thanks so much, Matt, um, for that welcome and for the kickoff. I am really excited to be here today to launch our work. Um, and before I, we get started with our really stellar panel, I'll talk for just a few minutes about what the lab is, why we're focused on small and mid-sized cities and how we're approaching our work. Uh, just some context setting for the panel discussion. So the Housing Solutions Lab is a new initiative housed at NYU Furman Center with funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that will work directly with small and mid-sized cities. And these are places with populations of roughly 50 to 500,000 people to help them launch and plan and evaluate promising local housing uh, policies that address their critical local housing challenges. We know that housing, where people live, the quality and safety and stability of our homes and neighborhoods affects every aspect of people's health and lives and opportunities. Uh, this effort is really focused on pursuing policies that help ensure all people have access to healthy, safe, stable, affordable housing in opportunity-rich neighborhoods. Um, so a little bit about why small and mid-sized cities. Uh, first, a large portion of the U.S. population lives in small and mid-sized cities. About 25% of all Americans, or over 85 million people, live in cities with populations between 50 and 500,000. And that number has been growing since 2000. This is compared to about 13% of the population that lives in larger cities uh, and with the remainder in rural areas or unincorporated places. Nearly every state in the nation has some small and mid-sized cities and the darker uh, uh, states that you see on this map um, have upwards of 40% of their residents living in small and mid-sized cities. So we know too that these cities face a range of challenges and also opportunities. So for example, home ownership is more common in small and mid-sized cities compared to larger places and a smaller proportion of people rent um, and this potentially means that more households have access to equity and wealth building opportunities that can come with home ownership. But we also see that some of the disparities in uh, access to home ownership by race and ethnicity are even larger in small and mid-sized city than they are uh, in larger cities. Black households in particular do not see an increase in home ownership uh, in small and mid-sized cities that white and Asian households do. So the home ownership gap is larger between black and white households in small and mid-sized cities than we see in the largest cities. Uh, the gap is also larger for Latino households, but the, the difference isn't quite as, as stark. And we also know that things are difficult for renters in small and mid-sized cities. Uh, as is the case nationally, about half of all renters pay more than 30% of their income in rent, and one in four is paying more than half of their income in rent. High rent burdens mean less money available for basic needs, food, healthcare, childcare, savings, and emergencies. So these affordability challenges are really rooted in the fact that in small and mid-sized cities, income has not kept up with housing costs. Rents increased by over 22% in small and mid-sized cities over the past 20 years, while incomes essentially remained flat and increased by just 2% in the same period. The pandemic has really exacerbated and highlighted how these affordability challenges matter and uh, addressing them will be a critical part of the COVID recovery. So <clears throat> these facts about small and mid-sized cities hide a lot of diversity. Uh, there is no typical smaller mid-sized city. Some places are booming and gaining people and jobs and struggling with displacement and gentrification and affordability concerns while other places have been losing population and jobs over time, and they may, may uh, have less expensive housing, um, but also lower incomes, lower tax revenue, and maybe fewer local resources to support uh, low-income families. We've already gotten started on some of uh, this work. As Matt mentioned, we've been working with a, a peer network of cities for the past 10 months, a set of seven cities nationwide. 
And we've learned a lot uh, from these cities about the challenges they're facing, about what they're trying, um, and about what the what types of support an organization like the lab uh, can can bring to be the most impactful. Um, some of what we're hearing from this work are some commonalities about the contest contexts that small and mid-sized cities are working in. Um, they may be more nimble than bigger cities, for example. Uh, the agencies may be more, uh, less siloed, uh, and those silos may be a little easier to break through. Small and mid-sized cities may be able to pilot or experiment with new programs a little uh, faster and able to course correct when things are not going as planned. But at the same time, smaller cities may have smaller staffs, smaller administrative bu budgets, lower tax revenue, and may lack the specialized expertise or uh, for in-depth data analysis or data management or for research and evaluation. They may lack local partners, philanthropic, university or civic resources uh, to support services or to support research. And that's um, really uh, where the lab is hoping to step in. Um, sorry, I just want to... Uh, to help fill some of these gaps. Uh, we have a, a team dedicated to working with cities one-on-one -on -one or in groups. Uh, we're also helping to tell city stories, whether through case studies, policy briefs, or by documenting the outcomes and impacts of different things that cities are trying on the ground. And we're bringing to this work a set of guiding principles and goals. At the core of it is a commitment to support, supporting local housing policy decisions that emphasize housing is critical to health, housing as a racial and racial equity and racial justice issue, uh, and to supporting meaningful community input and engagement in policy and program and design decisions. Uh, another critical aspect of our work is a commitment to rigorous research and evaluation. We want to measure and share what works in practice and help build the evidence base uh, for effective local housing policies. Uh, our panelists today have committed their careers to this work uh, in cities in different contexts nationwide, and we have a lot to learn from them today about how to do this. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and um, the Q&A function is open if folks wanna put any questions about the lab specifically. Um, more information about this work, some case studies about the peer cities that we're working with uh, is uh, available on our lab website, which went live today and we're very excited about. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, we'll be adding content over the next few months, including information about opportunities to join a second cohort of peer network cities uh, and also an opportunity for cities to join a a training effort um, around uh, designing a compre comprehensive housing plans. Um, and we also have an ask the lab function where folks can submit questions directly to us, whether about uh, policy issues or uh, information about these opportunities. And with that, I will turn to our really amazing panel. Um, full bios for the panelists are available on the chat. I'll ask folks to uh, unmute themselves and to share their, their screens at this point. So we have um, Mayor Libby Schaff of the City of Oakland. We've got Tara Ragavir, Tara Ragavir, I'm sorry, uh, the Director of the Kansas City Tenants Project. We've got Dr. Akila Watkins uh, for, from the Center for Community Progress. And we have Roseanne Haggerty of Community Solutions. So thank you guys so much for being here. Um, we're really so grateful to have you and to hear more about your work um, and uh, the work going on in small and mid-sized cities. So in this last couple of minutes, um, I'll just jump right into it. We've tried to make some generalizations about small and mid-sized cities, but I'd love to begin this conversation and hear from you all about some more concrete examples of what's going on in cities. Uh, housing policy priorities and strategies and challenges happening on the ground today. We've heard a couple of themes in our work with cities so far that I'll ask you maybe to start out talking about. And um, Roseanne, I'll start with you. And from some of the lab's initial work, we've heard about the importance of data, um, both to define problems and track outcomes, but also some real challenges in being able to use data effectively. Uh, Community Solutions has uh, implemented Built From Zero, which is a data-driven strategy to help cities solve homelessness with 90 cities and counties participating and that number growing. 
how has this work been done in small cities? How has it been effective? Have you seen any unique opportunities for data-driven work in small and mid-sized cities? First of all, Martha, thank you and congratulations on the launch of the lab. Uh, very timely and important. And uh, as you mentioned, we are working now with 90 communities around the country, a community defined usually as a continuum of care and homelessness terms, so uh, a, a county or county region typically. And uh, Built for Zero is a, a data-driven collaborative effort to help these communities reach what uh, we've defined as functional zero, a state of equilibrium where homelessness is measurably rare and brief. And the key to this we found in the years of really co-creating this movement is uh, having um, a kind of a common table, uh, almost we call it a command center, that is focused on all of the key players in a community actually working this problem as a population health challenge, uh, using the same measures, uh, sharing the same aim of a population level reduction in homelessness, and adopting a data-driven iterative strategy very akin to uh, a public health approach to a problem. Uh, and so what that looks like, and uh, uh, we now can really sort of articulate five things that communities are getting to zero have in common, is they have this shared aim that the, the goal of all of their homelessness efforts is to get to a sustainable reduction. And that may seem obvious, but frankly, the world of homeless services has heretofore been organized around programs and responses, not around that very fierce measurable goal of reductions at a population level that really requires organizations to sort of um, supersede their own uh, programmatic uh, interests to work in a collaborative way toward a community outcome. So the shared aim, having an integrated team, having everyone and the core members uh, are typically the not-for-profits who receive HUD funding, um, the mayor county executive office, uh, the, um, the Housing Authority and the VA for the region, again, agreeing to work toward that collective aim and to really mesh their teams as needed to move the needle on a population level basis. Third, and to you know, the, the kind of the opening point, Martha, is without by name real time information, now you know, appropriately uh, privacy protected, but uh, without that feedback loop to see how a dynamic problem is actually playing out you know, at a population level and individually in real time, at least you know, the data should be uh, updated monthly. It's really almost impossible we found for a community to know where they stand, what's working, what isn't, who's getting left behind. And frankly, without that kind of very high quality data that's comprehensive, that is um, accurate to at least a, a 90 degree uh, or 90% um, um, a level of, of um, uh, uh, accuracy, which you can kind of tell by balancing out your data month after month, you can't really tell if you're making equitable choices and if your system is actually performing and responding to racial disparities in homelessness. So data is, is, is actually without quality data. I think all of our aspirations for equitable systems are just talk. You know, that, that's actually you know, the, the, the evidence of whether we're getting the job done. And then um, third, uh, or fourth rather, is having flexibility in terms of how you can deploy your resources, whether it be your housing stock or your, your social services or other things that are the, the barriers that um, individuals and households face. Um, you know, kind of loosening up um, eligibility requirements to actually respond to what is like true for the individuals and, and people uh, who are uh, uh, struggling to uh, avoid or get out of homelessness. And then lastly, it's just having, we find this testable menu of strategies that have worked in other communities and that can offer a starting point for communities who are wrestling with the same problems. But uh, uh, interestingly, we, we, we really see it's the ability to work in this dynamic way with accurate data toward a common objective uh, that is more critical than any single component uh, to, to stay ahead of a problem. It's actually kind of the way we're kind of working our way through COVID, just that dynamic response to an ever-shifting problem. And to be guided by data, not by ideology or like the five-year plan we, we signed up to. And maybe to, just to illustrate in some small and medium-sized cities how this is working. Uh, we uh, have seen um, in the last um, year, uh, Lynchburg, Virginia, which is about 261,000 population, 
they've um, ended and held an end state, that functional zero end state for veteran homelessness and are making very steady progress on ending chronic homelessness. And uh, you know, one of the things that a place like Lynchburg has as you know, an advantage, and we see that across our you know, smaller and mid-sized cities, um, it's easier to get everybody around the same table in a community of um, you know, under 500,000. Uh, the, the, um, to, to your point in the introduction though, often these communities have fewer providers. And so the, there's a, a, um, a resource or a capacity gap. And so uh, our team has really styled itself uh, to provide the data analytics coaching, the quality improvement coaching, the facilitation of getting that team together around a common goal to help build capacity locally. Um, Lynchburg um, is um, an example though of, of a community that actually, and, and this may be true of many other uh, small and mid-sized communities, found and was creative in responding to sort of a housing stock mismatch problem. Uh, a lot of their housing, you know, yeah, uh, larger apartments or, 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 or single family homes. And so one of the, th the innovations they had to really explore was how to use the housing stock they had to deal with a largely single population. And they've really pioneered a lot of very creative supports for shared housing uh, and uh, figured out ways to uh, uh, deal with a mismatch be between the demographics of those experiencing homelessness and the, the, the typologies of housing stock, which is probably going to be you know, um, a, a not unfamiliar challenge. But also just quickly, you know, we've seen even through the pandemic, uh, I think four communities have, have hit and held a, a functional zero um, target for one or more populations. We've seen, I think 47 other communities make um, a statistically significant reductions and, and hold them. And so um, it really is kind of a validation that this data-driven collaborative way of working uh, that may be easier to mobilize in, in uh, smaller communities uh, is, is um, uh, quite powerful. Although I will say even our large cities in the Built for Zero movement on average um, are reduced chronic or veteran homelessness more than 20%. And so uh, uh, again, just to end on this theme of uh, it's the data, it's accountability for a result that matters as much as um, you know, the, the particular housing supply we're finding. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that and for those examples. And um, this, and Mayor Schaff, I think I'll, I'll turn to you now um, for some reactions to that. And some of the things that, I, that resonated that Roseanne mentioned was this you know, shared, um, shared aim, uh, collective goals, uh, how it's maybe easier to bring folks to the table uh, in small and mid-sized cities. But then, you know, looking at a city like Oakland, which is in a nine county area with 101 different cities and where uh, housing policies might be decided on locally and some of the data might be housed locally, but needs are regional. And uh, presumably solutions need to be reason, re regional as well. And this, this uh, theme of needing to think regionally um, has also come up through our work with cities. Um, so given that regional dynamic, um, how you know, in, in your city, in Oakland, have you been able to work regionally to think, think through solving some of these issues and thinking collectively about problems? Absolutely, Martha. And again, thank you. Oakland has been so grateful to be part of the 2021 cohort um, in the peer network uh, with the lab. So super excited about today. Um, let's talk about regionalism. Oakland is part of the 101 city Bay Area County, and that doesn't even include some of the most populous unincorporated areas of America. And uh, we know that when it comes to our housing crisis, it is a regional issue. At one point, the Bay Area as a region was creating 11 new jobs for every one new unit of housing that was being built. The growth of Silicon Valley has impacted the housing market tremendously in Oakland. Even though those jobs might not be in Oakland, the workers are actually moving to Oakland or pushing people out of areas that are becoming more and more expensive as that supply goes down. Um, I really want to hand it to our regional transportation authority and, and Bay Area Association of Governments that created something several years ago called CASA. 
and it was a multi-stakeholder um, effort. And, and you know, 101 cities, that's a lot of stakeholders to coordinate, but you had, you know, tenant rights organizations, you had labor, you had the business community, a lot of groups that don't usually sit at the same table together. We're all brought to the table. And ironically, the process was called CASA, which is the Spanish word for table, uh, to really ask ourselves, how are we collectively going to solve the Bay Area housing crisis? And we came out of that process with a recognition, like many um, processes like this, there is no silver bullet. And that particularly with the Bay Area's dynamics, we had to have a three-pronged approach. We call them the three Ps, production, preservation, and protection. So first, we do have a supply issue in the Bay Area. I know that's not true of other parts of the country, but it really is tr true for us. So we need to produce more housing at all income levels, but especially protected affordable housing. We need to preserve, and that means the existing housing that is naturally occurring affordable housing that already has below market rents or that has affordability protections that are about to expire and need to be renewed. Uh, a focus, and we really saw this during COVID, um, Governor Gavin Newsom put forward an initiative called Home Key, where in three months, Oakland was able to acquire, fix up, and house um, in, in more than 184 units, um, formerly homeless individuals. And these were in converted um, hotels, a dorm, uh, former dormitory for college, um, and in shared housing, just like Roseanne was talking about, 17 single family homes throughout the city that are shared housing for formerly homeless seniors. So that's the preservation strategy. And then of course, protection. We have to protect our tenants from evictions, from unjust rent increases. Uh, so protections were part of that also. Now, an exciting thing that came out of this was also uh, a request to our state legislature to create a Bay Area Housing Finance Authority. Mm -hmm. This was inspired by a similar regional housing finance authority that has been working for years in the New York city area. And uh, we were able to get approval of that by the legislature last year. What's cool about that is in California, to raise taxes, you almost always need voter approval. In fact, sometimes two thirds voter approval. Uh, I know that's not true everywhere, but it is in California. And what's exciting is this housing authority allows us, instead of having to put 101 different housing funding measures on 101 different ballots, we can actually do a single election for, for example, a general obligation bond to finance more affordable housing or acquisition and rehab. So very exciting. That is obviously going to be a main function of this regional housing finance authority. But to your point about what small and mid-sized cities need, um, the big cities usually had big housing departments that were able to respond to that like fire drill offer of money from the state of California to convert hotels and other existing buildings into permanent affordable housing for extremely low income citizens. But small cities did not. And so this regional housing authority is really going to be a regionalized free technical assistance hub particularly for small and mid-sized cities. Uh, and we are focusing, we have five pilots that we're focusing our TA efforts on. Um, I will find out later today whether the seed funding for those were approved in California's budget, which literally is getting negotiated as we speak. But just to highlight two of those, um, because they show where our priorities are, one is a regional system to prevent homelessness from happening in the first place. Uh, and I hope I get a chance to talk about our race equity analysis of our homelessness system. Mm -hmm. Another is help in this preservation piece. 
A lot of cities knew how to compete for tax credits for new affordable housing construction, but aren't accustomed to this conversion opportunity. So that's another area where we're gonna be helping small and mid-sized cities that don't have big housing departments, but really do want to do their share in addressing what is a regional crisis. And thank you so much for sharing that. And it's really exciting to see what's going on um, in Oakland. And, you know, I wonder, uh, and Dr. Watkins, if you could weigh in, what your thoughts are on what uh, what Mayor Schaff just shared in thinking about the work that Community Progress does with cities that have very different housing markets. Maybe there's a lot uh, about affordability pressures um, and growth and how to manage growth um, but you're working in the Rust Belt and Appalachia and places that are facing very different con conditions. Um, can you talk a little bit about how this might, how this resonates in the work that, that you're doing? So absolutely. And I'd like to um, just thank the Furman Center again for the invite. I'm really excited to be here and share um, along with this esteemed panel today. So, I, you know, I think a couple of things that uh, resonated with me uh, just a bit of a bit of a background. I am president and CEO at the Center for Community Progress. We are the nation's premier organization uh, dedicated to eradicating vacant, abandoned, and deteriorated properties. Um, we, you know, our work has traditionally been in the legacy cities, Rust Belt cities of America. Those cities that have uh, really faced huge amounts of disinvestment. Um, we are doing a lot more work in places like in Oakland, um, more sort of um, mid-sized cities that are growing and expanding. And, and, and partly because we really wanna focus on uneven development to your question, Martha, is that we do work in a lot of regions that have faced tremendous um, disinvestment, loss of population for about a generation or two. And so, um, and, you know, and a little bit about sort of what we're doing at, um, at a national level to help those cities begin to sort of reimagine, right, what a new uh, reality will be like, because, you know, the bottom line is that our economy has changed, our national economy has changed, we're more of a, we're, we are in a global economy, and so um, our world will not be what a post-World War II was, and so but it doesn't mean that our communities have to fall by the wayside either, right? It just means that we have to reimagine what they look like. And so, you know, um, I, you know, so I think a couple of things. I'm I'm really excited about how the political winds have shifted over the last um, over the last election. I do think this is a um, an important time in our cities to talk about equity, fairness, justice, viable economic development, community voice, right? So I think that. These are terms that we're seeing um, now that are being fully integrated, not just sort of at a rhetoric level, but I am seeing more and more cities uh, deeply incorporate um, these, these values and concepts within how they do work. So, you know, I think a couple of things at the sort of national policy level. Um, one thing that we are pushing for is the National Land Bank Network, you know, um, or, you know, my organization, we uh, work with the nation's land banks to help them sort of um, just be more clearer and more explicit around um, equitable um, land use development, right? So uh, really quickly, land banks uh, serve as a quasi-government organization. There are about 200, uh, um, over 200 land banks in this country that really help to become a repository for vacant and abandoned and deteriorated properties. And so that's important because land banks, um, because they are quasi-government, they have a higher sense that they have to serve, right? So they are accountable to the taxpayers. They are accountable to uh, local government and, and they, are, um, they have to be transparent and uh, really look at the community's best and highest interest. So, you know, we are really pushing for more um, federal funding of land banks to work um, alongside of municipal leaders um, like Mayor Shaft in, in California to really be able to be partners around what do we do with these uh, built structures and how do we use them more efficiently, 
right, for, for community's needs. And I want to talk a little bit more about sort of what are sort of our big ideals of how do we use land just more smartly, right? But the National Land Bank Network is one of the things we're pushing, and it's HR Bill 7103, if people are interested in learning more about it. And it's really about technical assistance um, um, to local government. It's also about having a larger sort of equitable um, a racial equitable development framework for how we think about land, how we actually um, dispose of land, right? Um, I think the other thing that is exciting me about um, potential uh, policy outcomes is the Restoring Communities Left Behind Act. Mm -hmm. um, this is another piece of federal legislation and it's um, House Bill 81-816. Um, 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 it is getting bipartisan support in the House and it, it dedicates $5 billion to uh, what we would consider small and mid-sized cities, right? And, and so um, this is an important piece of legislation um, that's really about putting federal resources so we can rethink, you know, how we use land. So, you know, um, for instance, right, and I'll talk a little bit about this as we, we go through our presentation, but we know because of COVID, we're going to have a vast amount of commercial property that is not going, that may never come back, mm -hmm. right, because as businesses had to go online, right, um, the physical address it, it may be something that's just not as important anymore. Can we rethink can we relook at how we think about commercial space? Can we think about that more as residential housing opportunities, right? Um, can we look at local zoning? Can we look at local zoning in a way that can convert some of this commercial space we have to residential space to take care of those sort of essential housing needs that were there and evident to any mayor in America before COVID and then after COVID, they became even more explicit, right? So, you know, um, looking at federal legislation as a way to catalyzing, um, you know, sort of, you know, the more equitable change is important. And we're really pushing for this because we know that solutions have to happen on a local level. And so equipping um, um, local leaders with the financial resources that they need um, and then also capacity building and models, right? So what's working, what, what didn't work and the reasons why are the things that we really do wanna push for in the Restoring Communities Left Behind Act. And then finally is the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, which we have been a proponent of um, for the last few years. And this is um, House Bill 2143. And it also has a Sen Senate Companion Bill, uh, Senate Bill 98. This bill really is going to be looking at um, the, the value gap that happens in a lot of small cities when we think about sort of the creation of new housing. So traditionally, when we think about, um, you know, sort of, you know, housing challenges, we do think of those larger cities where we see, where we see homelessness, right? It's, it's extremely explicit. We don't have as, as much of a robust conversation around sort of, you know, affordable housing and those opportunities in those small and um, um, mid-sized cities, especially those cities that have an abundance of land, but not necessarily sort of like affordable housing options. So, um, and the challenge is that a lot of these cities cannot support the sort of um, economic, um, you know, cost of building a city, right? So if it costs $150,000 to build a house, no matter where you are, because lumber is what lumber is, when we're looking at small and mid-sized cities, those costs are really hard to recoup, right? Because the, the local market just can't bear the cost of what it, what it actually costs to build a house. And so the Neighborhood Homes Invest, Investment Act is, is the answer to that sort of value gap between what it actually costs to, to build and develop um, adequate housing for local residents and the actual value and cost of that house based on the local market. And so those are just three um, sort of federal bills that we're having conversations with because as the federal government is expanding the definition of infrastructure, we really are excited about those bills um, being thought of as ways to catalyze and jumpstart local economies and also fill an important need around um, you know, fair, just adequate housing in especially in small and mid-sized cities. Mm -hmm. And thank you for that. It's really exciting to hear 
um, both in Oakland and in your examples of the resources coming to small and mid-sized cities to, to try to do this, this work. Um, but I want to pivot a little bit and build on something you, you mentioned as well around uh, community engagement and doing that meaningfully and sort of going beyond rhetoric around it. Um, and, you know, I think maybe community engagement is, is a broad term. What we're trying to get at is how to elevate the voices and perspectives of people who are experiencing housing instability, uh, who have the most to lose or gain from local housing policy decisions. Um, but we know community engagement can often be an afterthought or a formality, uh, or it's hard to figure it out how to figure out it's hard to figure out how to do it well and a lot of places struggle with knowing if they're doing it well. So Tara, I was you know hoping to hear from you a little bit. I've heard you say that eviction is an act of violence and that uh, the tenants you work with in Kansas City are experts in finding solutions to it and in responding to it. So if you could talk a little bit about community engagement and about uh, elevating the voices of folks who are most affected by housing policies. Thanks, Martha, and thank you to the Furman Center. This is an awesome panel. I'm over here taking notes on all of your remarks. I really appreciate the opportunity to reflect on this question, and I'll share a little bit about myself and the kind of multiple seats on the bus that I occupy at various times as a way of kind of introducing my thoughts on this. First of all, I'm the national campaign director for a campaign for a homes guarantee. And I actually think that's very relevant to say in the context of this conversation, because I actually think it's not false when local leaders in small and mid-sized cities say that the hand, their hands are tied behind their back because they just don't have the money to do some of the things that are necessary to make a real systemic change. Right. So secondly, I hold a role locally here in Kansas City, which is my hometown, as an eviction researcher. And actually, I've been studying evictions in Kansas City for almost a decade now. And for many years, I was coming back here and presenting on my data, building relationships with policymakers, making sure that the city had access to all the data that I was analyzing as well. And in that role, I was noticing eviction rates rise. And I was noticing communities being displaced from their longtime homes. So then comes my third role as an organizer. And this is actually where I'm gonna spend most of my time um, on today's call, kind of sharing my perspective and what I've learned since, um, since co-founding and building KC Tenants back in 2019. So we're an organization that is led by poor and working class tenants in Kansas City. We have weekly tenant meetings. We have hundreds, if not thousands of people in our base by now. We do all of the kind of typical activities that you might associate with a community organization, everything from uh, door knocking, canvassing to mutual aid, but then also policy campaigns, right? And one of the most important guiding principles of KC Tenants is that the people closest to the problem are the closest to the solution. This is something that you will hear in every single meeting that you might attend at KC Tenants. It's part of every public statement that we make. And it's really our theory of change and how we believe that we and our, our leaders are gonna change the world. So just a little bit about what we've done to kind of practice that theory. In 2019, our leaders made housing a key issue in the municipal elections. The dialogue was about potholes and trash. And then our folks started shutting down the town halls until folks started talking about housing and the issues that really impacted their lives. Later that year, we wrote and won a historic Tenants Bill of Rights in Kansas City that the city council passed in December 2019. Since then, we've won over a million dollars in annual funding for an office of the tenant advocate within the city. We have ongoing monthly meetings with the mayor and city council, and we're on the precipice of launching a very uh, exciting campaign to win a People's Housing Trust Fund that would introduce such transformative models for housing provision in Kansas City as municipal social housing, right? We want to be the first city in the country that starts to really take seriously what social housing could look like in the United States. So as I think about how cities can more authentically engage or deeply engage directly impacted communities, I think the most important starting point is thinking about the people it's more easy to engage than the impacted communities, right? And I actually think city officials need to take time to acknowledge who it's easy to work with, right? Who they regularly hear from, who shapes the dominant narratives and policies around housing policy today. Because I think in almost every city, 
I think maybe it's fair to say every city across the US and the world, those people are the property owning class, right? It's people who might have profit motives connected to housing. And it's actually important for us to acknowledge that because it actually takes a huge amount of work to shift that prioritization towards the other folks, right? The people who live in the housing provided by those folks, the people who rely on housing, not as a profit making venture, but rather as the place where they raise their family, right? So I have a couple of strategies that I was thinking about when reflecting on this question that I'd like to share with you. Um, these are strategies that I would, um, I would advise like city officials to take on, but I also think other nonprofits in these kinds of spaces that aren't representative necessarily of the directly impacted population could also engage some of these as well. So the first is to engage deeply and authentically, and that means building real relationships and not just when you need a group to do something for you. Um, it's actually critical. This is why we've pushed for this monthly space that we have with our mayor, where he's actually listening to testimonies. We are asking him personal questions, right? And then every once in a while, there's like a real urgent thing that his office needs. It makes it so much easier for us to move it with our base and get people really giving deep feedback because we're in regular communication, right? And in some smaller cities, I wanna acknowledge this might be hard to do because there might not be a collective of directly impacted people that it makes sense to relate to. And then you gotta put in the work, right? throw an engagement, a community engagement session and make it accessible to people, make it in the evening hours, provide translation. Actually send folks from your office to go door to door in an impacted community, right? Meeting people where they're at is critical, at schools, at you know, the offices of social services, uh, so social service providers, at job sites, right? The second thing that I would say, I see a lot of city officials and policymakers um, tokenizing individuals instead of relating to collectives, right? And we have so many examples of this locally where you know there will be one really powerful unhoused leader and the city officials will decide that that person now represents the entire community, right? So where possible, I think it's really important that policymakers um, intentionally relate to collectives of people with shared analysis rather than tokenizing individuals into positions of power or influence. The third thing I would say is adjust timelines, period, right? Not everything is gonna work at the speed that the city or the policymaker is used to when you're talking about impacted communities and the level of engagement that they will require in order for it to be meaningful. So that means adjusting timelines in a really radical way and real engagement will require that. Um, for us in Kansas City, that's meant that like, you know, the mayor was waiting for three months for us to write our tenants bill of rights. But as a product of having that extra three months, our folks actually got to write their own rights into existence, which is such a transformative way of making policy rather than the mayor and the legal department of the city writing something and then bringing it to, it, it to us once it's done. Mm -hmm. The fourth thing I will say is make commitments and keep them. Of course, actions speak louder than words and implementation is really important. The goal should always be material change in people's lives, not just a press conference that makes you look good. Hopefully that's self-evident, but I think more often than not, we actually see practices that tell us that the priority is maybe not the material change and it's something else. So make commitments and keep them. Um, another thing that I will share is just willingness and readiness to be held accountable. If you're engaging with a community organization that is really serious about organizing impacted people, if you're an elected official, a policy, uh, a policy maker, you will have moments of tension that come up between you and that community. What we always say at Casey Tenants is tension is good and leaning into tension is how we grow, right? But being willing to be held accountable is the first critical step. A couple final things that I will say, um, it's really important not to undermine organizing efforts that have to take place outside of the system. And I say this as someone who for the last year of my life has been organizing in an organization where we had to take radical direct action to stop evictions. We couldn't wait for policymakers because to be honest with you, the policymakers in the state of Missouri were not exercising leadership to protect the people. So we had to go shut down eviction court. And we did that for the majority of the last year. Some of the most 
painful things are when elected officials undermine that type of work in public when they really don't need to at all, right? Um, and they need to acknowledge that sometimes organizers and impacted people need to take matters into their own hands outside of the system to seek the justice that they're owed. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing I will share here is building in structural power shifts is critical, right? And this is one of those things that can help the reprioritization towards impacted communities when it's actually way harder for that engagement to happen in an authentic way. So building a formal like kitchen cabinet of people who are impacted, who represent these collectives who are aligned and doing the work in the streets every day is critical in a, in a structural sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, all of what I've described is what we talk about as co-governance. And this is not, this is like an ideological shift that I think cities and policymakers need to adjust. You should not be operating, operating in such a way that you're governing over or governing for, but rather that you're governing with. And this requires a fundamental shift in how policymakers think about their work. But when that shift is made is when we can actually seek out transformative change and escape cycles of incrementalism that I think too often we see, especially in small and mid-sized cities. Thank you so much for that. There was so much, so many powerful things uh, in there. And I'm sure that Mayor Schaaf and Akila and, and Roseanne all want to respond a bit. We, we are over time uh, digging into our Q&A. So maybe I'll, I'll ask each of you to respond quickly how that resonates for your work. Um, and then we'll turn to the, the Q&A. And maybe Roseanne, I'll, I'll start with you and uh, your work in the homelessness space. I especially appreciate it, Tara's point about um, going slow to go fast and to really readjust you know the ownership and power dynamics um, you know getting getting people aligned around common goals is you know not easy and I think we kid ourselves that we think that that's uh, 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 going to happen on some uh, rigid timeline so I especially appreciated the, the caution there around giving these new processes that are needed um, really uh, time to build what real accountability looks like. Thank you. And Mayor Schaaf, do you have any thoughts? Well, you know, it, it, what she was talking about made me think about racial equity analysis, uh, which is maybe not as much direct outreach, but it, it really, um, it codifies and, and makes part of your process, not just doing data evaluation, not just documenting the disparity by the data, but to actually go out and do qualitative interviews with the people most impacted. And, and I'll give some examples in like our racial uh, equity analysis of homelessness. In talking to people about uh, how, what their journey to homelessness was like, you could see clear examples of racial discrimination impacting their homelessness and not just one time, it's, it's a lifetime condition. And how that translated into policy change is for example, for homelessness prevention, most of our programs were limited to a one-time use. You're having a housing emergency, one time will bail you out with money. Mm -hmm. Well, racism is not a one-time emergency. It is a lifetime condition and we in government have to acknowledge that and change our systems to respond to that. Uh, so, so just, um, and, and I want to lift up GAIR as a resource for local governments. Uh, we have a whole department of race and equity uh, in Oakland. Uh, this is the most critical work any leader can engage in right now because systemic racism is robbing all of us of living in a society that is fair and fully enjoying everyone's talent and frankly, wellness. Um, I'm sorry, we'll, I won't get time to talk about our guaranteed income work in Oakland. It's something that I'm also really excited about. Sometimes we look at housing just as housing when also it is tied to the wealth gap and the income gap as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And, I get, and Akila, I want to hear from you. And if anyone has materials that they want to share with the folks who are on today, we're happy to collect them and then get them out to folks. Um, and so Akila, I'll give you the, the last word before we turn to Q&A and responding on some of this. 
Yeah, so I think I think a couple of things. Um, one is that I do think there's a reality when we talk about resident engagement work, which is why I think it's important that it has to be sort of an ongoing process, right? It doesn't just stop um, with sort of like one sort of like, you know, flashpoint. A lot of mayors are under a lot of pressure. This land is moving really quickly. Speculators are coming. Um, and so to have, you know, that is why, again, got to have very authentic sort of community relationships ongoing because to sort of like assemble people around this sort of flash, it takes time. Like building trust takes time, especially between government and the people that live there. We live in a very sort of toxic environment right now where we talk about sort of the role that government plays or should play and holding them accountable and that sort of thing. So I think sort of balancing sort of the speed at which things need to happen now, because again, I, I just see municipal leaders under a lot of stress, um, having to make things happen in a particular term with a particular, you know, city government. And, you know, you have sort of, you know, just a lot of different economic forces pushing in a particular way. And so, you know, to to sort of like get that, uh, to have voices, not only at the table to talk, because that's the other thing too, I want to sort of highlight. We want, so how do we get people really to, to participate in power sharing, right? Um, and, and so I do think like really helping residents, um, you know, creating spaces for them where they can come and learn around, like, you know, what are the policies up for, you know, local debate, like, what are we, what are we, how are land decisions made? Like, where do those conversations happen? And how do I be part of those, right? So really sort of educating people on where things happen, how they happen, sort of, you know, um, how to sort of lean in, like, all those things are important. I mean, we have a, a resident engagement um, um, fellowship, where we actually, and again, providing stipends, we pay stipends um, for, to our residents, because we get paid for our work and we we want residents to show up and be there in their fullness. It is important for us to compensate them for time, making sure, right, that meetings that we have, you know, don't need to all happen at 1030 a.m. on a Tuesday. We need to have them at times where we know residents can can come and make provisions for when their families are there. And then also we've actually played with the ideas of having thematic um, sort of um, leadership engagement. So when we talk about sort of vacant and abandoned properties, really looking at, you know, how we can infuse art in that. How can we infuse sort of, you know, community safety when we look at sort of, um, you know, problem properties in a neighborhood, right? So what that does in a lot of ways is that, you know, residents aren't just also a monolithic voice, right? Like they're young people in the community, el you know, elderly. They, I'm a working mom of three, you know? So it's like, how do you sort of create a table where various community voices can come and participate and feel like their voices are heard, right? So I think like we, again, use this sort of thematic um, overlay of how we can like get into sort of the more systemic uh, challenges that communities face. So I just wanted to sort of add that as some some context when we talk about resident engagement. Thank you. Um, and maybe I will throw in one last thing um, from the lab uh, before we have a uh, do have a couple questions. Hopefully we'll get to one. Um, uh, what so what can a place like the lab do to help? And whoever wants to jump in what can we help bring to this work? I've heard a couple of things around engagement and data um, and support, but if you had a response, what would it be? I'll just jump in with, I think we've all touched on, you know, there's a kind of a, a capacity gap and often in, in uh, city government and uh, maybe even the not-for-profit sector. And so reinforcing that, helping to provide the training access to, um, uh, tools that have been tested elsewhere just to accelerate uh, progress. I think that that is one thing that the lab is very well positioned to do is already doing. And uh, even as a, a, a conduit for some of the tools that are even being uh, put in the, the chat uh, now, especially on uh, racial equity, on the kind of data and, and, and uh, 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 financial instruments that can be transformational in uh, communities that may not have uh, the, the kind of the, the local resources or or um, uh, depth of staff that could bring those into those contexts. 
Um, I'll throw one out there. Uh, yeah. We need help moving from pilot to permanence to policy. Uh, there are a lot of exciting things going on across the country. You know, I mentioned guaranteed income, but they're all demonstrations. They're all pilots. We need to get these as policy. This needs to be the way that our federal government especially functions. And we need two things and, and groups like the lab can provide them. We need the actual like data analysis, you know, policymakers want to know that it's going to work, it's going to produce this result. But the thing I think people forget that is just as important is the narrative change. Uh, what has been done around the narrative of poverty is so offensive and so damaging, uh, it cannot be said enough. And so to help change the narrative, to tell the stories, uh, people don't just make decisions with their heads, they make them with their hearts too. And that is part of bringing the American people along with the policy change that must be radical, that must be soon, and must be driven not just by those numbers, but by people's actual beliefs and the dignity of humanity. And that is a way that the lab could help. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to take one question so I don't get in trouble from the people who are, are fielding questions in the Q&A. And here's a question, I think for Roseanne. In your experience, how has the idea of clearly stated shared aim, whether it is ending homelessness or ensuring nobody pays more than 30% in rent, maintained across changes in administrations and agency personnel? And this seems like something that others can also chime in on. But how do you maintain momentum on shared goals when administrations change? I think uh, Amir Schaaf got this exactly right. This has got to get baked into policy and not be just kind of in this, you know, like this was one mayor's initiative. Uh, so I think that's also very much about uh, a narrative shift that, that we all have to change our expectations and with issues like homelessness and, you know, eviction and, uh, uh, you know, what happens to uh, you know, land and, and disinvested communities. I think our, our kind of our public expectations have to shift. And so partially that's policy, but partially that's um, kind of a, a, a new story that uh, we, we are all participating in, in lifting up. Okay. So I think that is us exactly at time, which is miraculous um, and it flew by. And thank you all so, so much. Akila Watkins and Roseanne Haggerty and Mayor Libby Schaff and Tar Tara Ragavir. Um, it was such a pleasure to have you here with us today and an honor. And we hope to stay in touch as we uh, continue to launch our work. And for um, folks uh, watching or here joining us, Again, our Housing Solutions Lab website just went live and you can reach us there and ask the lab questions um, and reach me directly with any questions about our work or ways that we can help you. And we really look forward to staying in touch. Thank you so much and good luck with all your amazing work. Thank you everybody. Thank you.